Hello everybody and welcome to uh, what's going to be our last example of a t-test on a single population mean. So this one now we have uh, a two-tailed test and once more we'll make sure that we can see that when we read the problem so that we understand what it is because generally speaking that information is not going to be there if you're doing these types of problems on an exam or something. Similarly, that information is not likely to be available either. So we'll make sure that just reading this problem that we'll know what kind of test we're doing. Okay, so it's common in some universities to target a specific average in certain courses. At the end of each semester, the instructors faced with this constraint are required to determine whether their average is statistically different from the targeted average for the course. If they're either above or below, we have to make some adjustments. So let's assume that in a particular course, instructors are expected to have an average grade of 70%. Okay, there's one piece of useful information. Now this semester, the class average was 73% with 44 students. The sample standard deviation is 13 percentage points. So what kind of a test are we doing? Well. Again, I know I'm working with a single population because I only have one sample mean that's been given. So I have one sample mean, I have one hypothesized value for that average. I know I'm doing a t-test because I see clues all over the place. I have a sample standard deviation and I'm given s. Again, if this was a z-test, I would have the sigma, sigma squared, or I'd see population, the word population. I don't see any of that, and I definitely see some clues that I'm working with sample data. Well, what kind of test are we doing, a lower tail or an upper tail test? Well, here, when I read the problem, I just kind of skipped over it. But here I can see if the average is statistically different from the targeted average. In other words, either above or below. So we have this target of 70%, and the instructors will need to make adjustments to their grade distributions if the average is either greater than that or less than that. They need to make an adjustment. So that is what's telling me that this is a two-tailed test. So is that average, is it consistent with this target of 70% or is it different from that target of 70% in which case some adjustments will need to be made. So that's it. We've got our test. I think we've justified our test. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, I don't need to make any adjustments. If the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, then some adjustments should be made calculate our test statistics. So now we're into the same process as all the other similar type of questions. I have my level of significance is given. Here's 0.05. I'm going to calculate my t statistic. I have all of the little bits of information, 73 minus 70 over, I'm going to use 13 because I'm writing these down as percentages. If I was writing these down as decimals, well then I would be consistent with my notation and I'd use that standard deviation in decimal form. So this is 13 over root 44. There's my sample size here. And this gives me a test statistic of 13 over root 44. This gives me a test statistic of 1.53. What's next? P-value rule, rejection, a critical value. Whichever one, we'll do both, just for good measure. So here I'm doing a two-tailed test. I'm going to go down to my t-distribution. I have, oh, we better get our degrees of freedom. 44 minus 1, so I have 43 degrees of freedom. I come down here, and 43 degrees of freedom, 
Well, now I don't see it because uh, higher levels, uh, uh, higher sample sizes, we start to kind of skip. Instead of going individually, now we're going 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100. So now I'm just going to round it to the nearest value. So I need 43. Well, there's 40. That's the closest that I have. So I'm going to use these as my critical values. Now, you can really see just how close these values are. They, they start to only be different at the first, second decimal place. They're not that far off from each other. So we do sacrifice a little bit of accuracy here. But for the purpose of practicing doing these tests, we're not too concerned about that accuracy. So uh, let's see. I had my test statistic. I lose my train of thought. My test statistic is 1.53. I have my critical values. 1.53. I see it's between these two here. And so I'm going to follow these two all the way up. And I have these probabilities 0.1 and 0.05. Now, remember, this is a two-tail test. So this is one of those things where, again, we see how similar all of these different problems are. All of the ones that we've done using the Z tables, the T tables, they've all been so similar that when a student gets to a problem like this, they'll be inclined to say, well, my p-value is between 0.1 and 0.05, right? Because those are the numbers that I see when I look at my T distribution. And I get into this routine, I get into this habit, and so that's what I end up going with. We cannot forget, this is a two-tailed test. We can't forget that small but important step that I have to multiply this by two because it's a two-tailed test. And so my p-value is actually less than 0.2 and greater than 0.1. Similarly, if we're using the critical value approach, that's going to be alpha divided by 2 with so many degrees of freedom. So here, this is at alpha is 05. So I would need alpha 0.025. And here we have 43 degrees of freedom, although we're rounding it to 40. That's fine. So here I'm looking, there's my alpha divided by 2. And then I'm coming down, down, down. There's my critical value, 2.021. 2.021. So once more. Here's this distribution. Now, technically, as a two-tailed test, I'm going to reject if it's larger than that upper tail critical value. And because this is symmetric, the lower tail is exactly the same, only negative. And I'll reject if that test statistic is smaller. We do not reject if it's in between. Similarly, our p-value here, where our p-value says it's greater than 0.1. If it's greater than 0.1, I'm pretty sure it's going to be greater than 0.05. So both of these, again, we should always get consistent results. If at any point you find that your results are not consistent, then it's because of a mistake that's been made somewhere. Here we have enough evidence in both cases. We are unable to reject. Our evidence supports the null hypothesis. So what this is telling me again in the context of this problem, this instructor, uh, we don't have any evidence to show that this instructor needs to make any adjustments to their grade distribution. Okay, part C. Produce a 95% interval estimate consistent with this test. So we did something like this in section 9.1 when we were using the z-distribution because, again, we'll see the same consistency between a confidence interval and that two-tailed test at a comparable level of significance. The calculation is entirely the same. 
what you saw in section 9.1 was something that looked like this. That critical value times the standard error, here I have sigma because in section 9.1, we knew what the population standard deviation is. Well, now we're working with sample. And so now it's the T distribution and now it's S, the sample standard deviation. So our sample mean was 73, plus or minus this critical value. Well, I've got it right there, 2.021. Our standard deviation was 13. Our sample size was 44. So now this is going to give me an interval centered on 73. That margin of error, 2.021 times 13 over root 44, that margin of error is 3.96. So that gives me an upper limit of 76.96 and 73 minus. That gives me a lower limit of 69.04. Now, this is a 95% confidence interval for the true population mean. Here I can see my hypothesized value from this test. My hypothesized value here was 70. Remember, that was that goal, that target that we are aiming at for our grade distribution. And here I can see, well, 70 exists within that interval. Now again, this brings me back to this discussion. When we do not reject the null hypotheses, does it mean the null is true? The answer is no. When our evidence supports the null, what that means is that we cannot support the alternative. It does not mean that the null is true. If I fail to reject the null hypotheses, it does not mean that the population average is 70. It means that at that level of significance, I cannot differentiate it from 70. I cannot distinguish it from 70. It might be 70. And so looking at the interval helps to reinforce that concept because when I look at this interval, this is telling me I'm 95% confident that the true population mean is between 69 and let's call it 77%. The fact that 70 exists in that interval means that at that level of confidence, that level of significance, 70 is possible. That's why I don't reject. It doesn't mean it is 70. It means that 70 is possible at that level of significance. Therefore, I cannot reject it. So here we have our interval. It's consistent with the results of our test. I'm 95% confident that the true average grade of the population is between 69 and 77%. This is consistent with an inability to reject the null hypotheses because our hypothesized value lies within that interval. It does not mean that the null is true. It means that that hypothesized value is possible, and that's why we cannot reject it. Okay, good. That was nice, short, quick, sweet, done. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope this.